magic mushrooms used for thousands of years, but the government made it illegal back in the 60s. Well, they're back like the McRib and making all kinds of headlines with an 80% effective rate for those with depression and an 83% effective rate for treating those with substance abuse. Find out what we know on this compound, how it works with our brains, and where we are in getting these to the public and all other trials going on. Next on Technically a Conversation. Greetings, super friends. Welcome to another episode of Technically a Conversation. Here, we like to share an interesting topic with each other, which we've recently learned and hope you find it interesting too. I'm one half of your hosts, Isela. Joining me as always is Jose. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Doing pretty good. How was your week? Good. I'm glad that our national nightmare is finally over. Not the gun shootings, but the Amber Heard and Johnny Depp trial. (laughs) I was so sick and tired of hearing about that. (laughs) I didn't know if you were going to bring it up, but it actually felt more like the ending of some kind of Netflix show for me. It was like, I was mourning a little bit. I was like, oh my God, when they were going to read the verdict, I was like, already feeling that emptiness, you know? I was like, no, this is like the season finale of my novella. (laughs) No, it was more like Extreme Tiger or whatever that show was that everybody kept talking about, but I could care less. I didn't watch it either. I know we talked about that before. Yeah. I don't even have a desire to see it, even today. That's how I felt about the Johnny Depp trial. Oh, no, you missed out on some good, crazy shit. (laughs) Anyway, brief reminder, we still have the opportunity to win your very own coolest t-shirt of the summer, a Technically a Conversation t-shirt. Tell them what they got to do, Jose. It's very simple. Just leave us a review. Send us a screenshot to one of our socials. We're at Greetings TAC Everywhere. We'll read it on the show. And once we have 25 reviews, we'll give one lucky winner a sexy, technically a conversation t-shirt. So just check the show notes or check technicallyaconversation.com for all the deets. And thank you again to everybody who is listening and who has submitted a review. Shout out time. Here's the list, y'all. The Queens, Elena and Erica, The Duke, Stephen B., ContraZoom Pod podcast. And welcome AJ, our newest super friend. (laughs) Yes, new super friends always get the air horn. Totally agree. Yes, and our existing super friends as well, because we want to thank you and acknowledge you for sharing our posts on your social media. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. It always helps. Here, we're going to start with a question now. Have you ever had an experience that was so impactful that it changed your life? I know this is kind of a big one. That's a tough one. There have been many. Uh, I can think of a few dark ones, but I don't want to go too dark because I think I have a reputation of taking every podcast (laughs) to to dark depths. But uh, maybe finishing college. I was the first one from my family to finish college. And going into it, I didn't think that I could do it. I was very proud of myself for having accomplished that. Yeah, something nobody else had done in your family. That's really huge. That's awesome. And it didn't it give you like a new found sense of confidence? Yeah, a little bit. Definitely boosted my self-esteem. For sure. I was not the first one since I'm the youngest of my family, but I'll share another item that, or I'll share a different thing that did change how I view certain things. <laughs> This is very true, but this is more on the silly side. Was it when you took the Pepsi challenge? (laughs) And you realized that you prefer Pepsi over Coke? I don't even know what Pepsi tastes like. I'm so sorry. (laughs) It tastes just like Coke, but sweeter. There goes that sponsorship. (laughs) (laughs) I remember during middle school and high school that I would watch music videos and there was always a part in one of the music videos where like people would be moshing and all this mayhem was going on, but it kind of seemed fun, you know? Cut to my first show. It was called Pig Face. And a couple of friends were in the pit, Marco and Billy, shout out. So I, of course I thought, hell yes, I'm going to get in because my friends are in. Here's my chance, right? (laughs) I was going to jump in 
right around where they were because I'm thinking, oh, yeah, for sure. They're going to keep their dear friend safe. (laughs) But I'm pretty sure that my friend didn't see me. And he jumped up. And that was when I had jumped in. So when he came down, he accidentally elbowed me like right smack on top of my head. (laughs) Oh, man. I know. I got like a really big bump. Here's the Spanish uh, Spanish lesson. The um, slang Spanish word. It's kind of a fun word too, right? It's called a chichon. It gave me a chichon right on top of my head. (laughs) So it was like this big bump. That was like growing, but that completely rewired my brain and thinking moshing is not fun. (laughs) Tried it, got the bruise, was almost transforming into a damn rhinoceros. And that's a pass for me. (laughs) Yeah. I also realized early on that moshing was not for me. What happened? I had gone to go see a local band play and there weren't that many people in the mosh pit. There were maybe like five and this huge guy, he must've been as tall as you, Isela. (laughs) He ended up hitting me and I ended up landing on top of a table. There was like a couple sitting down there with their drinks. Like it looked like a scene out of a movie. Like I landed on top of the table, flipped it over. It was a big production. That sounds hilarious. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was more funny than anything. But I said, yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think I have the body type for moshing. Was that the last time you did it too? Yes, the first and last time. Right. See, it rewired our brain. (laughs) So today I want to talk about a very new plant-based drug that has truly incredible results. And interestingly, these results seem to stem from one experience. What is this drug, you ask? Talking about magic mushrooms. (laughs) That's right. We're going to talk about that drug that most likely a lot of your parents or grandparents tried Maybe in like the days of Woodstock or whenever that was, like 60s, 70s, I don't know. It's been around forever, but it's just recently having a renaissance, if you will, in science. We'll learn about what is being tested to treat, how it compares to its pharmacological competitors. That was hard to say. How it works in the brain and the other exciting clinical trials that are currently underway. You ready to dive in? Yeah. Let me get my bathing suit on. Yeah. Oh, also, now you know why. The mushroom is here. I thought that was uh, to commemorate Trump's penis. Oh, gross. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to you, I had blocked that out. And now you just re-put that in my brain. I'm going to have to force data dump that. <laughs> yeah. Every time I hear the word storm, I think of Stormy Daniels and I think of Trump's mushroom penis. So I think that says more about you than some other. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm so just kidding. Okay. So currently... It is in clinicals right now. It's treating two major problems, which seem to have skyrocketed in the last decade. Depression, PTSD. Well, depression and PTSD, that's not one thing. (laughs) And bonus, it's already been used to treat substance abuse, which is the cause of 750,000 deaths per year. The National Institute of Mental Health cites that 21 million adults reported a major depressive episode in 2020. That's an alarming lot of people. But in all fairness, if I think back to 2020, that was a rough year for almost everyone, especially considering there was a world battle with this invisible killer no one really knew much about, also known as COVID-19. So let's break down that scary statistic. What are these 21 million adults really experiencing? Taken straight from the National Institute of Mental Health website, The definition of a major depressive episode, quote unquote, it is a period of at least two weeks when a person experienced a depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure in daily activities and had a majority of specified symptoms, such as problems with sleep, eating, energy, concentration, or self-worth. So it seems pretty awful, especially if it's at least two weeks. That means at most, what is it? That's That really does sound pretty awful for 21 million adults. I think that's a Monday for me. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that's really awful if you don't want to sleep either or eat. I want. I love sleeping and eating. Oh my God. Are you kidding me? <laughs> me too. Well, I, I don't have a problem with the eating part. Sleeping is a little bit more difficult. That's true. You're like half, you're like a third of the way there or a fourth of the way there. But the weird thing is I don't feel sad though. That's good. I think that if you go too long with like sleep deprivation, I think it would really start to affect your your mood. 
like depression and all that stuff. Yeah, I, th I think it definitely affects some of my cognitive and verbal abilities as those that are frequent listeners to our podcast can attest to. <laughs> That's also because English is our second language. <laughs> yeah, that is also partially to blame. For sure. <laughs> so to put it into perspective, that represents about 10% of U.S. adults that reported a major depressive episode. However, it is our adolescents we truly have to watch because they're coming in at 12%. 12% of them ages 12 to 17 who reported a major depressive episode. Moreover, it's the biggest cause of global disability. All that to say, depression and PTSD are in the top five most common mental health issues in the U.S. Therefore, we could help millions of people if we can get better medicine. And we just might have. Before I get into that, let's first talk about what the leading current treatment is for depression. Pharmacological antidepressants, Prozac, Xanax, and those as such. Look, I'm not going to knock it too much because obviously it has helped some people and that's always good. But the unfortunate truth is that antidepressants come with a lot of side effects like weight gain, there's less empathy. They actually do feel less of everything, which is why they feel less sad. So that means it's harder for them to climax, it's harder for them to cry, etc. Another downside, they have to be taken daily. Many are addictive, which is another problem. Worst of all, half of those taking antidepressants slip back into depression while on therapy. That remission rate is so bad. Last month, an article was published in Medical News Today titled, Do Antidepressants Work Better Than a Placebo? With a title like that, do we even have to read the article? <laughs> it's like the ludicrous song, move, bitch, get out the way. <laughs> like no one's left thinking, hmm, I wonder what that song's about. <laughs> well, this is the first time I hear it, so I kind of want to find out now. The song, really? That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, it talks about unsatisfactory results of antidepressants. They're also known as SSRIs. So if I refer to them as SSRIs, you know, I'll clearly be referring to antidepressants. Of antidepressants as the first line of therapy, based on a study in Denmark, which concluded antidepressants do not have enough evidence to prove they work better than a placebo. Sad, sad trombone. Like, I, I'm going to go depressed trombone on that one. <laughs> you know what? I've got just a trombone for you. I heard the wallowing in that one, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> in Nature Medicine, I read an article on another study which states functional MRI scans show that the SSRIs can make patients with depression feel at least a little bit better. However, it's only temporary and it doesn't really change the overall wiring of their brain. So this is really just easing the symptoms of depression while the drug is in their system. Now for the fun stuff about the quote unquote new drug, and I'm kind of using air quotes here. Have you ever heard of psilocybin, Jose? That's what's referred to as microdosing, right? People do microdose on it, yes. Okay, yes, I have heard some people talk about it. Mainly one of our favorite Lex Luthers, Michael Rosenbaum. <laughs> He's talked about microdosing in his podcast. He suffers from a lot of depression. So that is something that he has tried and He's reported having a lot of success on it. Oh, that's really awesome. That's good to hear. So I'm glad that you've already heard of it. This is clearly not a drug that is a new kid on the block, so to speak. People in pre-Columbian Mesoamerica cultures like Mayans, Aztecs, Zapotecs, etc. have been taking this as medicine probably about a thousand years ago. Well, just like 90s wide-legged jeans, it's back, babies. <laughs> <laughs> And let me make it very clear straight out of the gate here. In order for psilocybin to be effective for depression or PTSD, it is to be taken in conjunction with a psychedelic-assisted psychotherapist. This is what we're going to be talking about today. I'm not really sure about microdosing. I couldn't find any clinical studies on microdosing, or at least I didn't come across it during my research. So sorry if that's a big miss. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, Michael Rosenbaum does talk about doing it with a therapist. And for him, he says that it really helps him to open up. I think for most of us guys, it's hard for us to open up and talk about our feelings, especially when we come from very machista upbringings. So for him, it's been very beneficial because he's able to open up and talk about things that he wouldn't talk about otherwise. And anybody who's heard his amazing podcast knows that he talks about things that most people don't talk about. So so maybe he is st slowly starting to come around since because the one of the last ones that I remember him talking about his uh, younger sister and he was very vulnerable and I really applauded him for saying all those things and just really being so open. So hopefully that's changing a lot for him. He has talked about some of the benefits that he's been able to reap from it. I know he also has a lot of anxiety, so it's helped out with his anxiety. It's helped out with some of the trauma that he's had from his childhood. So for him, it's been very beneficial. Yeah, see, it's it's like this wonder drug for so many things. But all that to say that we are in no way suggesting people try it on their own. It is very illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so the studies thus far have proven... To be so successful, one can easily describe the effective rate as very high. Excuse the pun. <laughs> Sorry, that was a bad pun. <laughs> First, the success rate for traditional antidepressants is about 45%. That's not very high. And specifically for cancer-related depression, the antidepressants and placebos were both at 40%. So sad. So guess what the success rate for psilocybin is? 90%. You'll find out after these messages. Did you know there was a Doctor Strange movie in 1978? Or that Tim Burton and Nicolas Cage almost made a Superman movie in the mid-90s? On Superhero Cinephiles, we take you on a journey into the world of superhero films, including the acclaimed, the infamous, and the obscure. And you might just be surprised at some of our takes, because here, we want to talk about the things we love, not the things we hate. Listen to Superhero Cinephiles on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Visit us on the web at SuperheroCinephiles.com, or find us on Twitter and Instagram at SuperCinemaPod. Curiosity is a main thread that's led me to where I am today. If I ever had a plan A, I've long since forgotten what it was. <laughs> I don't think that's plan A for anybody. That was what sparked my drive to go into this space. Where does that curiosity go would be what I'd like to explore. I'm Daniel Pointer. On Still Curious, I talk to guests from many worlds and walks of life about what lights them up, the ways they like to learn, and how they navigate the sometimes surprising situations they end up in through following their interests. What do people who are still curious have in common? and what can we learn from their stories that will inspire us on our own path. That excitement of going, oh my god, that connects. <gasps> That's so super cool. I started developing skills to cater to my own needs. It became a means to an end, solving all of my curious questions. Going through your life where everything has a kind of preciousness and mystery. Curious, creative, excited. That's what you want. What you don't want is people who just want to tick boxes. Still curious. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. How was your break? Good. It's nice to see you dancing again. <laughs> you were the one getting down. I was just doing like the little, uh, you know what? I was doing that little move that Michael Jackson does in the, do you remember the time? Do you remember? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> well, because you saw it. <laughs> <laughs> that little song on the Still Curious promo is so catchy. It is. It is. Also, I I love a New Zealand, that Kiwi accent. I totally love. When we left, you were guessing the success rate for psilocybin for depression. And I think you, you gave a pretty high number. What, what was your guess again? 90%. 90%. You know what? You're actually kind of close. <laughs> it's 80%. That's huge. That's twice as Twice as much as one, the placebo, and two, what the antidepressants, their efficacy. Now to find out, how did science really stumble upon this? The first double-blind, randomized controlled study was back in 2006. It was simply like, hey, let's find out what the drug does. 
Let's just get quote unquote healthy volunteers. Let's give them one single high dose, a macro dose and see what it does. So after all of that, they found that over 60% of the volunteers considered their psilocybin experience to be one of the most personally profound and meaningful experiences of their entire lives. So clearly something good was going on with this plant-based drug. Let's fast forward to 2016 now. And in 2016, the focus became, okay, if it made them feel really good, let's focus on people with depression. This is when another double-blind study was kicked off. This one for patients with depression who actually had life-threatening cancer and feared death. If you're fluent in Fancy Nancy, (laughs) it is also known as psychological and existential distress. Do you know who uh, Fancy Nancy, the Fancy Nancy character is in like children's books? I'll say. I was today years old when I first heard that. Oh, man. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. Well, to give you a quick explanation, you know, our fellow Mexican Dora the Explorer, she like helps everyone learn Spanish words, right? Okay. So Fancy Nancy is like the little helpful white girl who helps you expand your vocabulary. (laughs) Oh, okay. And by expand your vocabulary, I mean in fancy terms, expand your vernacular. See, I just channeled her right now. <laughs> yeah, I should have probably paid attention to her because I think my vocabulary is not best. <laughs> she No, she came out, I think, when my daughter I, when my daughter was around. That's the only reason I know her. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so back to our existential distress slash fear of death. <laughs> okay, n- I never thought I'd say that. There are 92 participants who, after one single day, After the psilocybin dosage, 80% of them no longer fit the criteria of having psychological or existential distress. And this is just one single day after one dosage. They were no longer afraid of death. They were no longer depressed. 80% to almost completely remove the fear and remission of cancer. I mean, that just seems huge. So skeptical say you might be thinking, well, sure, that's just one day afterwards. What about like a month later? Am I right? No, because I know that there has been a lot of research behind this. So I am less skeptical just because there has been a lot of scientific studies that have backed up those claims. Yeah. To the very end of the trial, they never went back into remission. 20% who had the placebo still, it helped. I think that's pretty awesome. That's very remarkable because I think If I were to be diagnosed with cancer, thinking about death would consume probably 100% of my thoughts. Agreed. That would be all I would be thinking about. So I guess just trying to put myself in somebody else's shoes, I'm sure I'm not the only morbid person who would just be thinking about that. That takes away a lot from your enjoyment of whatever life you do have left. So being able to overcome that and being able to enjoy the little bit of life that you have left is a big um, lifestyle improvement. Yeah, like a quality of life improvement almost, right? Exactly. Agreed. Yeah, I completely think the same thing. I'm sure I would just be thinking about my own mortality and nothing would feel the same. So there's nothing in psychiatry that works faster with these incredibly long enduring effects. Those participants are very normal. I really want you to hear their experiences. This was taken from the World Science Festival. (laughs) I know I cite that all the time, but that's because I love science and I love festivals. I mean, (laughs) just kidding. And you love the world. (laughs) And they love the world. I mean, come on. (laughs) (laughs) No, honestly, they do bring like the best, the brightest people in all kinds of fields of studies from all over the world on one stage. I highly recommend it to any of my fellow nerds. Sorry, not sorry, because you'll probably hear me quote them still in the future one day. (laughs) I'm going to play a clip again. I don't own this World Science Festival. It's called The Promise of Psychedelics. Please don't sue us because we love you. (laughs) The sources will be in the show notes, like in all of our episodes. I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, stage 1C. My first thought was, now I know what I'm going to die of. Which couldn't have been true anyway, you still never know. (laughs) I felt a lump in my neck that came out positive for Hodgkin's lymphoma. My wife was just consumed by fear that this is coming back. Things just really spun out of control. I was given the psilocybin, 
and I took the pill. I was in a space where nothing existed except me. I became aware that this is probably what death would feel like. I'm still with my soul, but I'm not here anymore. And it sort of gave me a lot of comfort because it really wasn't that bad. <laughs> it kind of gave me peace of mind because I had such a tremendous fear of this unknown that was death. I saw a large lump under my ribs, and it was not the cancer. It was my fear. I just screamed, F you, who the f do you think you are? Get out. It was my real fear, and it went away. <laughs> I banished it. <laughs> I saw this leg smoke come out of my body in like a mushroom cloud. I was thinking, from now on, there's no more fear of death or cancer to terrorize me. I'm healed. I have everything to look forward to. And then I started to have very deep, deep feelings. The only way I could describe it, even though I'm an atheist and I still am, was just bathed in God's love. It was untainted. It was just pure happiness, pure harmony. It's beautiful. I have felt a different reality. It's almost like hope. We actually have Octavian uh, Mihai and Dinah Bazer here this evening. I think right up here in the front row, you're both here. Octavian, where are you now? How are you doing? Thank you for coming and sharing your story. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, my cancer is cured, basically. It's been over five years now. Yeah, and, and I feel incredible. Uh, I mean, I haven't had any more anxiety. Um, I'm just living life normally. And do you credit that with the, the drug? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it basically all ended the moment the session ended. And it never came back? No. Amazing. Really amazing. <laughs> Dinah, thank you for your explicit honesty in the piece. Um, <laughs> how are you doing? Um, I'm doing great. I have other anxieties. I mean, the state <laughs> of the world is not really what I would wish for my grandchildren. Um, well, we've all got to work on that, though. I'm, I'm not afraid of cancer. I have not been since that experience. It's been nine years for me since I was diagnosed and treated, so I've been in remission all that time. And um, I was suffering such terrible fear and anxiety for the two years until I had the psilocybin. And I just, I just don't think about it anymore. I don't think about cancer, I don't think about, I had ovarian, I don't think about that coming back. I've had a few little episodes where I had genuine concern for my health, and I went to the doctor and had it checked out, and I was fine. And I didn't freak out, you know, it was just, well, let's just see what this is. So very, very different. Had, very. had you tried other therapies before this? I had not, except maybe eating a lot of candy. <laughs> <laughs> And you credit it, as Octavian does, with this single dose of Absolutely. The... Yes. Yeah. And what would you say to someone in, your, in, in a position such as you were who, were, who was having the types of thoughts you were having? I wish that this drug were available therapeutically. Absolutely. And I know people that are in that situation now. And I, I really feel for them. And I wish they could have this. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. I actually... Um, before I tried this, I actually tried Xanax, which was the typical thing someone, you know, the doctor would prescribe to me uh, to kind of like help me with the anxiety. And I have to say it really wasn't working, uh, mm -hmm. except for those like six hours or so while it was in my system. After that, I would just wake up and it would all just be back to normal. So um, yeah, that's, that's something I tried and it really didn't work. So I, I really think that it would be important for this to, to become available because it's 
pretty much, in my opinion, the only thing that's actually getting to the cause of the problem. What did you think about their testimonies? Yeah, it sounds pretty convincing. It is. It does sound like truly their most profound experience. I can see why people say that that's such a profound experience, given those two, uh, you know, I guess, what do you call them? Yeah, I guess testimonies. <laughs> Definitely. Moving on to 2018, Johns Hopkins recommended to the government to reclassify the drug from a Schedule 1 to a Schedule 4, which would be similar to maybe like making it a prescription, like an Ambien or Sonata. Uh, it would still require prescription, but it would be under very tight control. Being this indicated good value in treatment for both depression and anxiety, these issues became next the next targeted studies, thus taking us to 2020. The study was released in JAMA, a very respected journal of American Medicine Association, and it explained that there were 24 participants with long-term documented history of depression. Those that were on antidepressants had to be taken off carefully within about an eight-week span. This also gives you an idea of how long studies take to go from participant selection to articles being released for their findings because this actually started back in 2017. And like I said, it was released in 2020. Of the 24 participants that were screened, almost 90% were previously treated with standard antidepressant medications. 60% of them were still on it, like I said, when at the beginning of the trial. They were given two doses, two weeks apart, between August 17th and April 2019 uh, at John Hopkins Bayview Medical Center. They all returned for follow-up one day after the session, and then a week after the session, three, six, and 12 months following the second session as well. And 75% of them no longer fit the criteria of having depression. These numbers are really incredible. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention ketamine. Ketamine is also one of the most recent drugs that have been allowed to treat for depression by the FDA. The Downside for this is that it breaks down after a number of weeks. So this really does lack in the enduring effects like psilocybin has. Further, many studies show remission of depression within week one week post-infusion because the ketamine is dosed as an IV. It's not a very good alternative either. Again, depressed trombone. <laughs> To summarize, there have been six separate clinical trials, all reporting extremely impressive results, much higher than what we've seen in the other, uh, its competitors, I guess I should say. And this has led to over 60 peer-reviewed articles in very well-respected scientific journals. My thoughts are, isn't there a reason why our indigenous ancestors use this for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years? Clearly, it's effective for depression. But like you had mentioned, this is like the Swiss army knife of drugs. It's good for other mental disorders as well. Back in the 50s and 60s, psilocybin was used to treat alcohol addiction. I didn't even know that. <laughs> I didn't know that either. Right? It's so interesting. NYU brought it back, teamed up with the University of New Mexico in another place for this one. And um, this particular study had... A portion of the participants take psilocybin, and another portion of the participants took LSD. 83% of the 343 participants no longer had any signs of alcohol use disorder. This is also pretty fantastic news, considering 14.5 million people over the age of 12 had reported uh, having alcohol use disorder in 2019. There was even a study for one of your old addictions, Jose. Not delicious burritos, but tobacco. <laughs> I haven't heard that one. Yeah. 2014, Johns Hopkins did a study with smokers. Again, 80% quit, even at the six-month mark, where normally only 35% previous smokers quit using varinicillin, and that seems to be the, uh, the most widely effective uh, drug, a smoking cessation drug. But really, 35% is categorized as effective, then 80% must be like phenomenally effective, or what I would just simply call truly effective. These are the people that on average smoked for over 20 years and averaged somewhere around 30 cigarettes a day. That's huge. When I quit smoking, 
I had been smoking for 23 years and I smoked about a pack and a half a day. Oh, <gasps> what is that? It was about 30 cigarettes. Oh my gosh. So that was you too then. Yeah. I know I've talked about anxiety. So I want to say it was around 2012 or 2013. My anxiety got so bad that I was starting to get chest pain. Oh, wow. Well. So um, the doctor that I have, she gave me, uh, I want to say it was Wellbutrin. Is that the one that gives you those crazy dreams? No, this is, um, I think it's, it's an antidepressant, but it also works for anxiety. And it's also supposed to help you quit smoking. So the doctor was like, yeah, twofer. It's going to help with your anxiety. It's going to help with your smoking. But for me, it, it didn't work. I took it for about three months and then I stopped because it didn't do anything for me. But the thing about those type of medications is that there's so many that are used to treat depression and anxiety. What works for one person doesn't work for another. So that's why there are so many different drugs for depression and anxiety, because you try one for a few months and if it works, then they keep you on it and they just adjust the dose. If it doesn't work, then there are hundreds of other medications and, you know, really everybody's biology is different. So they have to just keep on trying different drug after different drug until they find the one that works with your own biology. Yeah. Like your chemistry or something. I can, I can see that. Yeah, and for me, Wellbutrin didn't work, but uh, the only thing that I did find is that it did make me cry more than I normally cry. And I'm already like a big crier. So it was um, kind of frustrating because even watching like commercials, I would start crying. Oh, no, that's interesting. <laughs> Which in full disclosure, I do that now, but <laughs> it was even worse. It was kind of more <laughs> uncontrollable. Oh, man. That's That sounds pretty awful. They gave you just another problem, if anything. <laughs> it was fun, though. Crying is always good. <laughs> it is. It really is. It's a good release. Another giant issue I was particularly interested in in these studies was the one for PTSD, because PTSD is so prevalent and often associated with other issues. So it's in conjunction with like depression, anger management issues, like you know, things like that. So if we could help people with PTSD, we could help so many people. And who knows, maybe even prevent the next mass shooting. For psilocybin and PTSD, I was only able to find where University of Florida back in 2013 tested it on mice. Low doses of psilocybin virtually erased their conditioned fear. So I can't wait to hear more on this particular issue. We've talked about several trials. Let's shift gears. Do you want to get into the brains like a zombie? Let's do it. All right. I don't think I have a bathing suit for that, though. <laughs> it's going to be a weird one. <laughs> <laughs> the drug does seem to quiet the specific part of the brain, which houses that repetitive, constructive mental loop. Those parts where people usually repeat to themselves, oh, I can't get through the day without so many cigarettes or so many drinks, or even simply, I'm not worthy of being loved or I'm not lovable. These drugs seem to reduce that activity here, but they increase the activity in the prefrontal cortex, which is where all the logic and the reasoning happens. And that's really the basics of what they do know. It should be pointed out that scientists don't exactly know how these great results are being achieved. However, I did hear on one more than one occasion that you would be surprised at how much we don't know about the brain. At any rate, with each new trial, I'm sure we're getting closer to unraveling this mystery of how the compound works. What we do know is the drug is out of your brain six to eight hours, and yet it has such a profound effect. It is your ego dissolution that is really effective. That's what makes those destructive mental loops completely be eliminated. As the ego dissolves, it allows for more connection to others and your environment. These experiences have what people in the biz call a noetic effect. For us out of the biz, it basically means they are not perceiving these experiences as like subjective, but more as a revealed truth. To quote the Mandalorian, this is the way. <laughs> Knowing that, I can see why people feel so strongly about their experience. It's beyond a conviction. So give me your thoughts on this. I think it's very interesting. And all the anecdotal stories I've heard, it seems like it does work. I think like any other drug, I think more studies need to be done. What others do you think they should be doing? Just like with everything, I feel that there have got to be some side effects. 
Um, so I think they need to look at that more before it does get green lit and it becomes something that's like a topical, like a regular prescription medicine. So, you know, not just look at all the good, let's look at what side effects are possible. Everybody is different. So just because something works for somebody doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody. Right. They did mention one of the ones, one of the articles that I read, they did mention that they were very concerned using it for PTSD in case that the person has a bad trip. They didn't want to cause more trauma and more fear and all of that stuff. So that that is a real, a real true thing that they're still looking into. So there are a ton of other upcoming studies as well. I got this list from the Johns Hopkins website. They will determine the effectiveness of psilocybin as a new therapy for opioid addiction. That's huge. Alzheimer's disease, like I mentioned, PTSD. Also, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. I'd never heard of it, but it's also formerly known as chronic Lyme disease. Also, eating disorders like anorexia nervosa, which, by the way, did you even know that that's the most fatal mental disorder? I did not know that, but I know that it is very common. I didn't know it's that common because I don't know anybody with it. <laughs> well, we stand to lose so much if we don't reclassify this drug. PTSD, depression alone. If America doesn't take care of their soldiers like they aren't already. Um, yeah, I said it. I said it on this podcast. I said it. <laughs> we really do need to look after their mental health of our soldiers as they return from tours. We're only creating more and more cases out there. And if it's not psilocybin, then just anything that works. And as long as it doesn't cost a ridiculous amount that only Bessos and Elon can afford. <laughs> that I do agree on. We need to watch after our veterans more. Protect them as much as we protect gun ownership rights in the U.S. Oh, that would be nice. June 2022, where are we at? In regards to getting this treatment through the phases of testing... To my pleasant surprise, the government, specifically the FDA, has granted breakthrough therapy status to psilocybin, and they're actively helping researchers design clinical trials to help get them passed through the phases quickly. But it's still incredibly difficult to get the federal funding, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still really promising. And hopefully they're saying we could feasibly see this out in about three years to the public. It's much sooner than I would have thought. Yeah, yeah, this concludes our learning trip, so to speak. <laughs> so I'm glad that you've heard of most of it. Did you uh, Did you enjoy the stats and all this? Yeah, it was definitely very interesting. I'm glad. Let me also add, if you are in crisis, call the toll-free National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK, which is 8255. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All calls are confidential. There's even a website, suicidepreventionlifeline.org. No matter what anybody says, you matter. I think it's nice that you give out that number. That's one of the charities that I personally support a lot. I think that more people need to know that there's resources available when they're going through a difficult time. Yes, 100%. Well, congratulations, lovelies. You've done it again, folks. You've learned along with us. Go have that conversation with your old hippie dad or granddad. and <laughs> See if they had a similar mystic experience. Or better yet, with your doctor, if you're even thinking about doing something like that. Oh, yes, absolutely. We hope you have been entertained by our chat. Invite you to join us again next week. If you are enjoying the show, please leave us a review, tell a friend, subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, all the socials at GreetingsTAC or email us at GreetingsTAC at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 915-317-6669 if you have a story to share with us. Yeah.